What's up, guys? It's Lee here for Discovery Studio World. Hope you're all okay. On this upload today, we're going to deep dive into the JFK assassination. This November, it's going to be the 7070. <laughs> That's getting ahead of myself, isn't it? The 61st anniversary of the JFK assassination. Now, there is a lot of controversial topics which I like to delve into. Uh, it is quite controversial, it's complex, and there's a myriad of things that you can talk about because of it. So I thought I'd just give you a brief overview as to how deep I can go, really, and see what you guys think. So for this topic of conversation, if you've seen the headline already, you'll see that I'm basically telling you that I can prove to you, and I can prove to you without a shadow of a doubt, that Lee Harvey Oswald was innocent. I've got the proof, and I'm going to show it to you before the end of this video, so do not want to go anywhere, all right? So, my proof. Okay, so when Oswald was arrested, he claimed he was a patsy. Now, anybody who's done any research into the JFK assassination will see that realistically, at the worst, you could argue, Lee Harvey Oswald was a low-level CIA operative uh, because of his movements and because of how he was moved around, shuffled around. He was maneuvered into that position so he would take the fall for the JFK assassination. He really was. And that's why he said when he was in the Dallas, well, actually, when he was being maneuvered between the Dallas interview rooms, he said when he was in the corridor that he was just a patsy and he was absolutely spot on. Uh, when he was arrested, he was kept by the Dallas police without hours, without hours, without any representation whatsoever. And he com bitterly complained about it as well. He said that there was nobody there to give him any legal representation. And they just kept him and kept him and kept him for hours and hours and hours. Now, was that a legal process which the Dallas police and the FBI followed? Now, that's a question in itself probably not now when he was kept by the dallas police they showed him photos of him with the rifle that he was supposed to have used on jfk and he looked at those photos and being a photographic analyst himself he turned around and said that's not me somebody has copied and pasted my my head my face onto somebody else's body now he knew that straight off the bat that because he was a photo analyst. Now, it was rather interesting to note that if you actually look at those photos closely, you will see that the photos that are taken with that rifle is completely different to the photo of the rifle that has been paraded outside the Texas School Book Depository by the police. That's the rifle that he is supposed to have used. Now, initial reports by the mainstream media, uh, and I'll talk about that in a second, not only was the Manlika Kakano uh, rifle found, but a second rifle was found. A Mauser was found. And indeed, the mainstream media at the time did carry this story and repeated it over and over. But then I think it only lasted either a day or even a couple of hours. I'm a little bit unsure about that, but there's definite reports, repeated reports of this Mauser being found. And indeed, there is footage uh, of a second rifle as well, which is rather ironic. But then, of course, the mainstream media made it go away. Of course, the famed three bullets against a moving target uh, through, a, a, through a tree. Could he, could, could he have done it? Uh, could Oswald have pulled the, the trigger on a manual bolt-action rifle and done that damage to uh, 
uh, Governor Connolly and JFK? The answer is a blatant no. The magic bullet. They called it the magic bullet. CE399. Barely a scratch on it, and it went through multiple bones through multiple people. It is unheard of, even to this day. That's why it's called the magic bullet. So the mainstream media, they they took the took the story, three bullets from the sixth floor. It was Oswald. It was just all over the media. Oswald, he said he was on the second floor snack room when the whole thing was taking place. And the policeman, a Marion Baker from the Dallas police, saw him in the second floor snack room. Now, the interesting thing about this was that the lift in the Texas School Book Depository was broken. Now, if the Texas School Book Depository lift was broken, he would have to fire three rounds from a bolt-action rifle with pinpoint precision, then store the gun, have run all the way between all those boxes, which was ceiling high, I may add, from right from one end of the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository all the way over to the lifts. But then he would have had to go on down the stairs because the lifts weren't working. He would have had to gone all the way down four flights of stairs. There were two ladies on those stairs running down the stairs to see what the commotion was all about. And they they swear blind that they didn't see anybody else on the stairs. And uh, he would have ended up on the second floor of snack room where, as I've already mentioned, he would have seen the policeman who, by the way, says that he wasn't he wasn't uh, out of breath or anything like that. He was cool, calm, collected. And what did he do? Did he slip out the back entrance? Did he, you know, as if he was guilty? No, he went out the front entrance where everybody else was going. Now, does that sound like a guilty person to you? So if you've been and looked at my channel at all, you might have even seen uh, a couple of my videos. Uh, there was one that I made uh, called Veracity Denied, which was kind of an homage to the Nigel Turner series, The Men That Killed Kennedy. And it was my version. And it was a bit of an epic documentary, which I put together. Uh, two and a half hours it was and in it uh, there was a specific part of it which um, if I can drag it up and find it you'll, I'll show you here but the point of it which is very very important was all about Oswald and his transfer from the jail cells uh, from the Dallas police headquarters in the basement and the interesting sides note to this which is really really important is that it never should have happened why well as history has shown us it really appeared to be almost like a staged situation um, if you actually look and watch uh, the media and how it was uh, portrayed. Even when Oswald was being brought out in front of the media, it looked like a staged event. Of course, then Oswald himself was assassinated by uh, Jack Ruby, the nightclub owner, in front um, of the very same media. But interestingly, Many people probably still don't know this, but even to this day, 61 years later, nearly 61 years later, and that is that it never nearly went ahead. And that was because of two of the police, uh, policemen who were actually either side of Oswald. As you see them um, on camera, and they actually suggested, both of them actually suggested, you know, everybody's down there in the basement of the Dallas 
police headquarters. Why don't we take Oswald a different route? If they do that, you know, we could get we can get him out of here and nobody would have even know. However, they were told no. They were given orders. He must be transferred in full view of the media. And this order came down from the White House. Now that is massive in itself. So the fact that the order came down from the White House, that Lee Oswald must be transferred in front of full view of the Dallas Police Headquarters, and that's where Jack Ruby shot and killed him. But could he have done it? Could he? The Warren Report probably tells, still tells us to this day that he shot three shots from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository with world-class precision. But could he have actually done it? The answer is no. Definitely not. Even to this day, there has been contradictory evidence that um, bullets were fired from the uh, around the grassy knoll area. This was even found out by Gary Mack, and it was from a Dictabelt recording from a, a police outrider that accidentally left it on, and they were able to put it into evidence. And then the House Assassinations Committee uh, had to bring it into evidence. Gary Mack was one of the one of the people that brought it forward, and they conceded that. Uh, a second gunman must have fired at JFK. Thus, a conspiracy was born. Why? Because that in itself suggested that Lee Oswald didn't act alone. If you believe that it was Lee Oswald that pulled the trigger. And of course, like I've already suggested in this mountain of proof that he can't have even pulled the trigger because... On top of everything that I've told you, even though to this day, the official version says he does or did, apparently he suffered from what was called Maggie's Draws. Now, apparently that meant he weren't no good. He was a very, very poor shot. So to suggest that he would get three um, incredible world-class precision shots with this commission exhibit 399, which the bullet which they found, which didn't have a scratch on it, well, barely had a scratch on it, is preposterous, to say the least. Due to the work of Gary Mack et al, on finding evidence, a police outrider jammed his radio on and called the shots in Daly Plaza that day. The House Select Committee on Assassinations reluctantly agreed there had to have been a second shooter from the grassy knoll, but still maintained Oswald's shot from behind. This in turn now means that there are two official versions of the JFK assassination and the latest one involves a second gunman which by definition means there was a conspiracy to kill the President of the United States. It's a very valid criticism of the Warren Commission that it failed to follow up many, many important leads and witnesses that came to its attention. One of the best examples, I think, is the fake Secret Service man up on the grassy knoll and a Dallas police officer. Within a minute or two after the shooting, Officer Joe Marshall Smith ran up on the grassy knoll following the other witnesses. That's where they all went initially. And Joe Smith pulled his pistol when he spotted a man behind the picket fence up on the grassy knoll. And this was a man dressed in coat and tie. And this man, even looking right into Smith's revolver, said, hey, I'm Secret Service. And he pulled out some credentials that to Officer Smith indicated that he, this man was legitimate. Smith left him alone and went away, investigating other areas in the plaza. The important part is that the Secret Service at no time had any agents anywhere in Dealey Plaza, with the exception of the agents who were riding in the motorcade. So here's a guy passing himself off as a Secret Service agent to a Dallas police officer, and there was no Secret Service agent there. The Warren Commission either didn't know that or didn't want to know. They didn't even ask Officer Smith pertinent questions about that encounter. And to me, that's one of the great failings of the Warren Commission. And a typical example how important evidence was overlooked initially or lost at that time. There was some new evidence that came out in uh, late 1976, evidence that I was responsible for, 
in that the researchers had long been aware of recordings of the Dallas Police Department's radio channels. The department was using two at that time. And some interference began just a couple minutes before the assassination occurred. And that interference continued for five minutes or so after the assassination. And it effectively blocked all police communications on their main channel. What wasn't known was which officer was responsible for it. My thinking was that if the officer were in or very close to Dealey Plaza, his open microphone may have picked up the sound of the shots. From that theory sprang an investigation by the House Assassinations Committee. And after some digging, they found what they thought were the original recordings. They had the scientists analyze the, the uh, recordings and decided that uh, after some, some tests and then firing some test shots in Dealey Plaza and recording those, that there were four shots fired during the assassination, perhaps as many as six. And that, of course, proved conspiracy. Because they don't believe in it, or because they feel it's politically advantageous to themselves not to investigate it, they will never know the truth. But how can this country go on after a quarter of a century of this cover-up? How can we build on that? We're building on a lie. We've got to know the truth. And that, in, in itself, just throws the Warren Commission report under the bus. It really, really does. Now, what I'm going to show for you now is the ultimate proof that there was a lot more than just three shots fired. So I want you to take a good, long look at this collage of shots, which were, uh, which you can see from the day. All right, and I'll, when I show when I show you this, you'll see the, what I mean. That there was definitely, possibly up to nine, maybe even more shots fired in Daly Plaza that day at the presidential limousine.